The Holy Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days but he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the mother of us all. Amen. It's one of my least favorite experiences. I'm at a cool new restaurant or watering hole. I've waited in a long line and consulted the menu just so I can order the hottest new tacos, coffee, or craft beer. Finally, I get to the front of the line, place my order, and upon hearing the total, hand them my credit card. When, to my great dismay, they gesture with aplomb to a handwritten sign hanging over the till discreetly. Cash only? I read the sign sheepishly, hoping not to have my fears confirmed. But inside, I say to myself, cash only, really? Don't they know that it's 2024? Moreover, don't they know that this is really inconvenient for me, and not just for me, but for half of American adults who say that they almost never or never carry cash. Usually, the person at the till does know, and so they gesture kindly to a dark corner wherein lies the solution to all my problems, the thing that will get me out of my embarrassing predicament and keep me from going home with empty hands or worse, an empty stomach. The ATM, installed for the convenience of patrons like me installed to keep commerce flowing despite some obstacles. Keep commerce flowing despite obstacles. This, my friends, is a universal experience. It isn't limited to ATMs in the corners of dingy taquerias. In fact, we find it in today's reading from St. John's Gospel. It was expected in ancient times that Jews from all over the land of Israel would stream into Jerusalem for important festivals, especially for three festivals. 
Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. As the Jewish people began to spread out in the Roman Empire, many of them still wanted to make these pilgrimages to Jerusalem and celebrate these festivals with their people. There were some obstacles, though. They wouldn't be able to bring their offerings from home as their ancestors had. Their animals to be sacrificed and their grain, wine, and oil to be tithed. Everyone wanted commerce to flow, however, so they brought hard currency instead. Gold and silver coins. There was a problem, though. The locals in Jerusalem didn't accept this particular coinage, so they needed to exchange their coins for local currency. And then, finally, use that local currency to buy their offerings, especially sheep, cows, or doves to be sacrificed in the temple. It was a complicated process with lots of steps, but like the ATM in the corner of the bar, it ensured that people who made a long journey could go home content. No one really questioned that money changing or animal selling was a necessary part of this system, a modern solution to a modern problem. Nobody questioned it, that is, until Jesus showed up. When Jesus saw the commerce that had engulfed the temple, he was enraged. He quickly made a whip of cords and drove the animals out of the temple, letting them run free in the narrow streets of the bustling pilgrim-packed city. Then, as if he hadn't made his point clear already, he took the coin boxes of the money changers, upturned them, poured the money out, and just for good measure, overturned their tables too. As if to explain himself, Jesus shouted at the stunned merchants, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. To the merchants, this made very little sense. It would be like someone preaching against the ATM in the corner of your favorite restaurant. Why would anyone be opposed to making people's lives easier? Did this Jesus really want people to bring their animals all the way from home instead of just bringing a few shiny coins in their pocket? Moreover, did Jesus want these people's pilgrimages to be ruined? So what if the money changers and the animal sellers were making a little money in the deal? Everyone agreed it was a reasonable fee. To the merchants, Jesus' zeal did not make sense. It seems to be directed at all the wrong things. All they're trying to do is facilitate the worship of God. Make it easier for more people to come into the temple. But Jesus, truth be told, doesn't care about their motives. He doesn't care about their motives. Instead, he wants to focus on the true worship of God. That's what he cares about. He wants worship in the temple to be focused on God's abiding presence there and on nothing else. You could be forgiven for seeing Jesus the same way that the merchants do. 
In this reading, he seems unnecessarily rigid, like a real fundamentalist, even. He finds fault in things that other people don't question, that they simply accept as a regular part of life. But Jesus' reasons transcend zeal. While the people thought that this commerce was no distraction, Jesus saw how it kept people in the temple from seeing how God was doing something new in their midst. Even if the people thought that they were being proper and pious, the truth is they didn't see Jesus. God incarnate right in front of them. And that was a real problem. We have to consider the rest of the reading too. Jesus wants to prepare the people for that moment, not far off, when this temple, a great and holy place where the people interacted with God, would be no more. He's trying to prepare people to worship God's presence in a new way, through a new temple, the temple of his crucified and risen body. Jesus might seem like a radical in our gospel reading, but he's trying to prepare the people for an even more radical change. As Christians, we come together today to be in the presence of God. We know that Jesus is here as we read the scriptures, sing, pray, and receive the holy sacrament. Jesus wants us to keep our worship pure and focused on him. He doesn't want our minds to be so focused on commerce or money or anything else that we miss him when we come together today. More profoundly, Jesus wants our worship and our lives to leave enough space. Leave enough space where we might be able to perceive the new things that he is doing in our midst, even today. After all, we live our lives in the temple of our Lord Jesus. Not only when we gather for worship in this space but also whenever we gather together with other believers to share our burdens and our cares. Remember how he taught us, whenever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. To me, this is the ultimate convenience. God's presence with us here and wherever we go in life. Amen.